Hello and welcome to episode four of The Religion Punk. My name is Beth and I'm here with my co-host, the Dr. Darf. In this episode, we are taking a look at the book of Job as one of our favorite biblical examples of suffering. And to kind of get us started, I wanted to share kind of a funny story of my own suffering from this past weekend where it was my very first Mother's Day. And so I have a one-year-old at home. She's gonna be one here in a couple of weeks. And so this was gonna be my first Mother's Day. I was very excited, looking forward to it. And the night before Mother's Day, you know, we got the baby down, she had a bath and everything was going great. And she went to sleep and we were looking forward to watching a movie. And all of a sudden we smelled this nasty smell in the house and we were like going around the house and it smelled like sewer. And we discovered that the main line to our city sewage was backing up into our basement. And so now I have extreme anxiety every day. Now that when I flush the toilet or I take a shower, or anything like that because I'm constantly worried that there's going to be something bagging up into the basement and and this wasn't even our sewer I mean this was everybody in the block sewage so I'm like paranoid about everything I was telling my husband that we're going to get a camera so that we can have it in the basement so that we can check it throughout the day I mean <laughs> I'm talking about super super paranoid and so I felt like this story just really fit into today's episode of suffering and anxiety and to kind of get us started we're going to talk about anxiety and what anxiety looks like as a christian and so um, if you haven't figured it out by now i mean we're four episodes in so you might not have figured it out yet but i really like to talk to my friends about religion and i know that's kind of a taboo kind of thing and your mom probably told you that that's one of the things you avoid talking about but I really honestly just can't help myself. I'm always interested in what people think, why people believe what they believe, because everybody has their own faith and their faith is unique to themselves. And so um, I was talking to a close friend of mine and she's suffering from severe anxiety and depression. And as she was asking me about my own anxiety, which is something that I'll probably share a bit more throughout this episode, she said to me, the thing I'm having trouble with is at what point does anxiety become a sin because the Bible says a lot there is no need to worry or be anxious what indicates that anxiety is a lack of trust in God and so let's kind of unwrap some of the questions here where does anxiety come from we got a very large subject here because uh, anxiety can come from many different places one might find it even helpful to try to differentiate between anxiety and depression I think because our world today is so chaotic that many, if not most people, suffer with some kind of anxiety and or stress. As you mentioned, your stress this past weekend. With anxiety and stress, there's also, I think, worry. Um, many people worry about their future, worry about what's going on with our country and politics and all that. I've heard many Christians over the years and, and even preachers and sermons talk about how great a sin it is to worry. But I feel sometimes that if everyone would just be honest with themselves, that there are probably more people that worry uh, than there are people that don't worry. Many people will cite Matthew chapter 6, 25 through 34, where Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, or about your body. What you'll put on is not life more than food and body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add one single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, for they grow neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today, is alive, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith, therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. 
but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. The New King James Version mainly says, do not worry. But whether uh, we use the word worry in translation or the word anxious, uh, I think both of them pretty much describe what the Greek is saying. But I think Jesus issued this statement or these words as a way of offering encouragement and comfort. Jesus did not come beating the people in the head by saying, you're all sinners if you worry but rather he brought guidance rather than judgment. So then I guess you're saying that anxiety doesn't necessarily mean that you have a lack of trust in God. Well, and I'm not even sure that we can say that it's sin for that matter. So for the Christians out there who struggle with anxiety, how can we continue to trust God? I mean, is there any comfort in scripture that we can turn to aside from in Matthew? I think we'll find there's lots of comfort found in the Bible, but a thought that I had this past week as I was looking over our preparation for this broadcast is that we might take note that Jesus suffered with anxiety at least on one occasion, and that was at the time that he was facing uh, being arrested and going to the cross. And in Luke chapter 22, verse 44, it says, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. That's a pretty horrific image uh, when you think about it. Again, it kind of goes to show uh, maybe the humanness side of Christ. But as I said, we can definitely find comfort if we read through the scriptures. And, and we don't have time to search all those scriptures, but I would direct you probably first to start reading the book of Psalms, because so much in the book of Psalms, we find uh, that in times of distress, that God is there, that uh, he brings comfort. And the emphasis is always that God is always faithful. To go on, there are many different kinds of anxiety and depression. To get a little technical here, there's a book called the DSM-5, which is called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. But it's put out by the American Psychiatric Association, and there are numerous pages that talk about various kinds of anxiety and depression. And to mention only a very small portion of what they call specifiers for depressive disorders with anxious distress, uh, the feeling keyed up or tense, uh, feeling unusually restless, difficulty concentrating because of worry, fear that something awful may happen, like your basement is going to flood with uh, sewage again. At any moment. A uh, feeling that the individual might lose control of him or herself, feeling heavy, feeling failure to find pleasure. Uh, even as I think about the time we visited Disneyland and there's that plaque as you're entering to Disneyland that says you're now entering the happiest place on earth. Also some other research that I did, uh, Dr. Tim Clinton and Dr. Ron Hawkins, I think are very reputable. And they state that depression can have a variety of meanings because there are different types of depression. Clinical depression as a disorder is not the same as the brief mood fluctuations or the feelings of sadness, disappointment, and frustration that everyone experiences from time to time and that lasts from minutes to a few days at most. Clinical depression is a serious condition that lasts weeks to months and sometimes even years. It's reported that 35 million Americans, more than 16% of the population, suffer from depression severe enough to warrant treatment at some time in their lives. Well, given to 13 to 14 million people experience the uh, disorder, but I want you to keep in mind that I think it's like a lot of medical type statistics is that's what we know about. 
that there may be an even higher percentage of people out there. It's like I was told by a doctor many years ago about diabetes, that he was estimating that there were Americans, people that are walking around with diabetes and they have no knowledge that that is what they have. Well, and I think that number could probably be even higher. I mean, not to mention the pandemic we're going through right now is probably driving that up. It's the world we live in. Everybody's anxious. And that's true. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if everybody that we encounter every day has some level of anxiety now. I think if you're feeling anxious, you're not alone. Well, I'm hoping that we can bring some kind of hope to some people because And I've given some technical information, which I haven't even scratched the surface, but the science behind anxiety and depression is so broad or wide or difficult to define because there are so many different kinds, so many different kinds of symptoms. One cannot just look into the Bible and find a scripture that you can jam into someone's face because sometimes people will do that and they'll say, you're sinful because you're depressed. And I don't think that's what Jesus was trying to say either. It it saddens me that I find people that are so ignorant when it comes to talking about anxiety and depression that some people will give advice. I know one woman who used to just say, well, just be happy. You know, you're feeling depressed, just be happy. As if that's going to pull a person right out of the severe depressive mood. But I want to tell you a story. Years ago, I had a young man come to church one Sunday morning, and right before the service, I mean, as a pastor, I was preparing, you know, for the service and getting into worship, and this man came up to me, he was a visitor, and he said, "Uh, do you do any counseling, he said, and I said, well, yeah, I said, I've been trained to do counseling, and I do some counseling, and I said, what is your problem, and he said, I'm planning to commit suicide. This was a Sunday. We're celebrating the birth of Christ. We even had a fellowship dinner after church, you know, uh, where everybody was getting together, which I invited the young man. And I made him agree with me that we would meet together just as soon as church was over, the fellowship dinner was over. And that Sunday afternoon, I met with him. And one of the things that I advised him to do was to go see his doctor, his his physician, and get a a physical workup of what the doctor, you know, thought, and which the next day he did that. When I visited with him many times after that, he was a totally different person. I mean, he was upbeat. He was a computer technician. Largely what we talked about was computer stuff. But he was a different person after receiving, taking his medication. Now, I know that there are a lot of Christians out there that just think, ah, that is a big crutch. Uh, I know that there are people that might want to criticize me for telling the man to go find a drug. But the point is, he did not commit suicide. And that was my objective. I learned many uh, times over the years and since then that people suffer with chemical imbalances. And I've had many friends and family members and even myself go through different bouts of depression. But the sad thing is there are always those ignorant people out there that are ready to judge and to judge something that they know absolutely nothing about. I I don't think that there should be shame in having to have help, but I always kind of suffered from anxiety. And when I had my baby, I was diagnosed with postpartum depression, which was hard because I had family that would say to me, this should be the happiest moment of your life. You know, you have this baby and what they're not seeing is that my entire life completely changed overnight, you know? You don't prepare yourself when you're pregnant to all of a sudden have a human that dictates 24 seven of your life. But it's hard because I, I'm not a fan of taking my drugs. I do take them, but like you said, it makes you a different person. And sometimes, you know, I guess this weekend, in addition to my basement flooding, one of our dogs died. 
and everybody around me is crying and upset and I was sad but I couldn't actually shed a tear which bothered me a little bit and I knew it was because the drugs I was taking were balancing out and counterbalancing or whatever it does my emotions and so sometimes I I don't like to take them because yeah it makes you feel a little weird sometimes it makes you feel like you're a little heartless because you're not reacting the way that people might expect you to and on the outside people don't know that you're taking drugs for it well i know that there are times and in fact i can also speak to a lot of people out there in ministry because there are a lot of ministers that suffer with depression pastors people that work in churches Years ago, I kind of had a little bit of a theory about that, because I think as pastors, we prepare sermons and messages that we hope that people are going to be able to grab hold of, and it's going to build their faith, and it's going to bring about changes in people, and and I think the discouragement comes in the sense that we want to help people, we want to help people change for the glory of Christ, and that doesn't always happen. In fact, that may be more of a rarity than something that is normal. When you look at depression, um, there can be times when a person, sometimes they enter into a black hole where they have difficulty climbing out of that hole mentally. I wrote a song one time called The Prison of My Soul, which I don't know for my own life, maybe it's a little bit of a theme song, uh, but in dealing with depression, some of the words are, I've been gone in deep depression when my heart was dark and cold in the pit of deep dimension, buried deep, trapped in a hole. When my soul cried out in sorrow and I loved my sin no more, it was there I found my savior in the prison of my soul. One can enter into a dark hole of depression, and not even know why. Uh, not even know why, what's causing them to have that kind of a mood or to feel depressed. There is a sense of heaviness. Uh, there's a feeling of despair. And I can imagine, again, many other ways to describe how people feel when they're suffering. And I hope that what we say here, that it will bring some kind of hope to someone that if you fit the description that we've given about being depressed, feeling depressed, go get help. Find someone, a professional, a family doctor, maybe even a friend that you know that can kind of in, in, give you some kind of encouragement and not judgment, uh, but get help. Tell your doctor how you're feeling and, um, hopefully through that process even the bible i'm not saying the bible is not good enough to provide hope and encouragement there there are numerous verses but sometimes when you're in the state of depression and you're looking at a, a book that is about three inches thick that has 66 books and you wonder okay where am i going to find encouragement i think i'll read numbers no <laughs> probably probably not you know uh, or lamentations. Hey, there's a good depression journey, you know, uh, lamenting. No, there, there are numerous verses that can help you. But again, uh, there is a lot of things that we have to consider uh, when we're talking about anxiety and dealing with depression. Right. And, and shame too. I mean, there is no shame in asking for help. And I feel like we're getting better about this in society. Um, May is supposed to be National Mental Health Awareness Month. And knowing that there is no shame in asking for help. And for me, on my own personal journey with depression and anxiety, it was really, really hard to ask for help because you do feel like, you know, here I have a baby. I should be happy and over the moon about it. But like you were saying, being in this dark hole, sometimes there's no reason why you're in there. I could never explain why I feel the way I feel. I just feel it. It's probably feelings of being overwhelmed or not being able to just to what's happening in life, not having the support available. I mean, right now with the COVID pandemic, that's been even harder 
because yeah, my parents live far away. They can't just come and stay with us like we had always planned on. And so it's like when your reality isn't what you were expecting it to be, that can throw you in that hole even deeper and it's hard to get out of. So there is no shame in asking for help. I know that asking for help sometimes is expensive. For me, I, I take medication. I see a therapist every other week, but you have to think about it and investing in yourself and your mental health is probably one of the best moves that you can make which I think kind of leads us into the Bible book, Job, um, because I think it's a really good example of suffering. And so I've actually just recently been reading Job and I read it because of I was following along with the Bible recap podcast. And it just, I think the timing of it was just incredible. So I have another friend and this friend is, it's one of those where she has cancer and it's very severe. She's a young mom. Um, she has three kids that are very, very young and is stuck with this unfortunate reality that she might not have the opportunity to watch her kids grow up. And as a friend, I mean, what do you say to that? Especially when you also are struggling with your own anxiety and depression and trying to, you know, her, her suffering is obviously worse than mine kind of deal. And I think that kind of also puts that into the toxic positivity of, well, at least your life isn't as bad as this person's. And so for me, I mean, there's two ways I always look at this is it's hard for me to, I guess, relate because I think, oh, well, I can't talk to her about my own suffering because hers is worse than mine. But then how also do I be a friend? Again, in mentioning those books that where you may not find so much comfort, like Lamentations. There's much to say about the book of Job. Job is a book that is 42 chapters lengthy. Uh, Job is a book that many people get lost in, or maybe they end up reading after the first three chapters, you know, all the bad things that happened to him, and then they get lost in all of the advice that's being given to him throughout the rest of the book and the disaster. There's a Jewish rabbi, he's been around for some time by the name of Joseph Telushkin. And he wrote in his book, Jewish Literacy. Uh, and he said that Job was deeply religious and a saint. I don't think a single Jewish child has ever been named for him. I don't think I've run into anybody named Job either. But then he says that's because he led the most pained life of any character in the Bible. Now, many theologians believe that the book of Job was a book of fiction, uh, that it was a story. I personally, myself, believe that Job was a real character and that the events that did happen to him. However, Job was written in poetic form, uh, style. And just because a person is described in a, in a poem or style does not take away from the fact that they were a real person, that their story is real. Um, there was once, for some of the older people out there, there was once a rock and roll singer by the name of Buddy Holly. And Buddy Holly is that person that wrote That'll Be the Day and Peggy Sue. And Buddy Holly died February 3rd in 1959 in a plane crash after a concert uh, in uh, Clear Lake, Iowa. It was a snowstorm and they barely left the runway, the airport, and the plane crashed. And of course, back then they didn't have the internet and all the things of, of the technology for notification. They basically, I think, didn't find out that it happened until daylight and, hey, there's a plane that crashed. But he was a, a great musical person and a great artist. Years later, in 1971, Don McLean would also write a popular song called American Pie, describing Buddy Holly's death as the day the music died. There again, just because it is written in uh, maybe with allegory, with poetry, how, whatever kind of genre you want to begin to classify the bits of literature in, there again, the story can be very real and very reliable. And I think because Job is kind of a challenging book to read because it's in poetic form, that if you are having trouble reading it, YouTube is a fantastic place to be. 
Um, there's amazing videos of people that explain. There's some Bible studies available on YouTube that help explain that chapter, and we'll link those on our website. Uh, that people sometimes use to bash other people to try to minimize their suffering by saying, well, look at Job. You know, you got sir problems, but that's, you still have your house. You know, but look at Job, look at his suffering. And your suffering is nowhere compared to uh, what Job suffered. Probably a more stronger theme in Job, it teaches a lesson in righteousness. Job was a righteous man. Job had a great faith. Job was like a song that we used to sing in church as a chorus, I've decided to follow Jesus. And I've decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. That's Job. He lost it all. He lost his family, his home, his possessions. And even his wife, you know, ends up telling him, you know, go curse God and die. I'm trying to remember if he actually got a new wife. I hope he did. And even his friends who had all this terrific advice and you put it all together, I 30 some chapters of their advice or whatever, their dialogue, the friends in the end are rebuked by God. And in the end, Job is honored. And Job is honored by God for his faith and his righteousness. And Job is blessed with such an abundance that is even beyond imaginable. And, you know, maybe that is something we need to probably think about. And uh, sometimes whatever we lose, uh, whatever we go through, uh, we can think about what we have. And we could also think about ways in which God has blessed us that is unimaginable. For me, I think that's the biggest point is that God rebuked these friends. And I have heard so many examples of people even being told by their church family that, oh, well, you have cancer because you didn't pray enough, or, you know, your, your child died because you didn't believe enough, and, or the toxic positivity of, well, at least you have food, at least you have a house over your head, be happy with what you have. That's, that's Job's friends, right? And so God rebuked them. God acknowledges that we all have our own individual suffering and that we can lean on him and trust him. That to me is the biggest point of Job. I guess my follow-up question though to that is, given the years of experience you have in counseling others, what advice do you have for Christians or really just anybody on how to be a better friend to those who are suffering? How can we not be Job's friends? Well, and I was thinking about that. And I guess, first of all, I would say, listen, listen, and listen. Listen and don't judge. Listen and consider that what can happen to other people may also happen to you. Because we have that idea given to us in Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. But it says, dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. And you know, that's probably one of the worst things that we that we find sometimes among Christians today is you go share with someone and what you get is judgment. Sometimes before they even listen to everything that you're trying to, to pour out in sharing your pain and what you get is judgment. It's a very strong principle that, you know, if you're going to be a spiritual person and if you're going to be faithful in the sight of God, and obedient to uh, the love of Christ, then that is something where you should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And hopefully that's what we are doing in this episode is encouraging our listeners that there's no shame, that they can ask for help if they need help, or how they can help others if they do know of someone who is in pain or struggling. Well, I was just visiting the other day with a mental health professional. They agreed with me uh, an idea that I thought about. 
and that is the world that we live in is is filled with such chaos that if you look at the psychiatrists, the psychologists, the uh, licensed professional counselors, all kinds of professional people, pastors, people to provide guidance, that I don't think that there are enough of those people in this world to fix everyone that needs fixing. And one of the main problems of that is economics. Because uh, last time I priced a psychiatrist, I think they make about $300 an hour. I think a licensed professional counselor might be $100 an hour. But whether they're $100 an hour, $300 an hour, $500 an hour, whatever it is, think of the poor person, the poorest of the poor, that might be in the deepest of despair. That, that is why, again, we have to try to encourage people to seek out help wherever they can find it, because we do want people to be victorious. Yes. And we will have links to share on our website for if you just don't know where to start. Um, we'll put a collection of that on the blog section of the website. And then to end this episode, of course, because we talked about uh, medical things, I have my medical disclaimer to read to everyone. Um, of course, the idea of anxiety and depression is a very tough issue, and we want to acknowledge that while also throwing out a disclaimer, therefore, please note that the conversation today is for informational purposes only. No part of our conversation or sources presented are intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Also seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment, which includes symptoms of anxiety and or depression, as mentioned in this podcast, before undertaking a new healthcare regimen. And never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you heard or read from this podcast or social platforms or website. This statement is also to be included on our website in addition to helpful links and resources if you need help but don't know where to start. And as always, thank you for joining us today and listening to our episode.